It's going to be all right. We're safe. We're safe. Door slams. And then they play the prodigies. Oh, my God. That's the funky shit. <laughs> that part of shit is where I did realize how dated this movie was. Welcome to another episode of Foreplay. We are still deep in cosmic horror, and this week's film is Event Horizon from 1997. Um, and this film was, th this is a very interesting film. So it stars uh, Sam Neill, who is very near and dear to my heart. And also we get some some Lawrence Fishburne in here. Uh, so a lot of actors that you, uh, Jason Isaacs, in a very kind of early part of his career. Oh. So, so a lot of actors that you guys might know and be aware of. However, I bet many of you have never seen this movie. We've been moving into uh, kind of the deeper, more obscure recesses of cosmic horror as we go week by week. And this film, kind of a cult classic, uh, but not one that was very popular in its time. This is one of those movies yeah. you will always see on lists of people where it's like movies to watch while high, movies that are mind fucks. You know, like these are like the classic ones it's always in. And if people don't know, it's why the fact Sam Neill's in it's funny because most people know Sam Neill for like Jurassic Park. <laughs> but he's obviously in another like Lovecraftian classic, which is In the Mouth of Madness. Which is brilliant, which is, yeah. Right in a similar vein, I think it was a couple of years earlier. So basically, if people don't know, even though you're probably mostly going to know him as like a leading man, the hero, he's also mega in these particular type of movies, as we'll get into in this particular case, because obviously he can do a different range of acting. He's not just the leading man, is he? Yeah, is I also think it's good that he embraces it, because you will get some <laughs> actors that they find films like this like ostensibly silly, so they don't want to throw themselves into a role. Well, no chance of that with Sam Neill. He's <laughs> chewing the fucking scenery. In I, I love it. I mean, this is what I like about Sam Neill. I, I love everything about Sam Neill. You know, I love if you guys, I don't know if you guys have seen Children of the Revolution, which is a satire movie he made about Stalin, which we might get to on this show about sometime, which is, you know, which is brilliant. It's really in our funny. Stalin, Stalin month. <laughs> in our, in our uh, dictator satire month. If we ever, if we ever did a month of, of satires, I think that would be a really good one to have in there. It's, it's deeply funny. Um, so he's just got great range as an actor. I even liked his kind of like shitty, I don't know if you guys saw his shitty um, Merlin miniseries. That was yes. on American TV. He's great at that, that, even too. though it's quite yeah. bad. As, as, yeah. as, I mean, by the way, I'll give you the example in this one, right? Obviously, this is not, by the way, some Kurt Russell level actor. This is actually like a real bona fide actor who can do very serious roles. He could probably win an Oscar in like a supporting role or whatever. But in this movie, as, as you're talking about, he completely embraces the fact that certain parts of it are supposed to be cheesy. Like, uh, spoiler, because we obviously don't care about spoilers on this. Towards the end, when he's gone fully evil, he's sort of become like the fucking like acolyte of hell essentially all he does for the last 10 minutes is anytime anyone says anything vaguely related to like religion it's just a one-liner tag for him like if they're like this is hell he's like not yet like, <laughs> everything's just like everything's ridiculous <laughs> it's whatever they say so even though they all can't stop themselves saying things like this is hell on earth not no not yet it isn't like you know, we, get, we get it we get it but he is just like your sins chewing the scenery isn't he like hell is only a word Reality is much, much worse. Oh, he's loving it. He's I, loving it. I also love as well because, as we'll get to, nobody knew what the fuck to do with this movie. No, is it no. a slow brooding horror? Is yeah. it a summer action blockbuster? <laughs> and there's a scene when he comes out the cryo tube and Sam Neill's walking around with his stomach sucked in, like in shape, out of shape, 50s guy from fucking Family Guy. And he, it, it's just great. I, I, I Like, he is unquestionably one of the best things about this movie for, oh, for, sure. for sure for sure um but it is a movie with problems uh, sure I, and we'll get to why there are problems because i did some research on on the creation of this film and it is also very very strange and probably could have been yeah. a much better movie had it not been kind of tortured in po in post-production uh this yeah. was directed uh by paul william scott anderson who is mm. i mean this is probably his best movie I think that's fair yeah. to say, considering his list of films include 
the original Mortal Kombat movie, which also I love, by the way. So no one really loves that film. Like I mean, I, I love it for what it is. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. No one really loves it. He did uh, most of the Resident Evil series. I guess he did. He's Death. A hack, Monty. The, the term is a hack. I believe. <laughs> he, he, just, a... <laughs> you him, he, he makes another movie about Resident Evil. There you go. You know? He made he made the recent Monster Hunter movie. So he basically just became a guy who made video game movies eventually. And yeah. uh, we all know how well most of these video game movies. It's, it's a real out. shame because he was he was set to be like some sort of bad boy of cinema in like the mid nineties. His feature debut was something called Shopping. I was like a teenage kid at the time, and uh, in the UK, the big like you know kind of hysterical screeching crime wave thing in the media was this thing called Ram raiding, which is where you steal a car crash into the front of a shop steal everything from the shop and drive away and he, and he made a movie called shopping about that at the time it was happening and was in the news and there were calls for it to be banned and all this like fucked up stuff over here in the uk because you've got to have a license for that art obviously and uh yeah it was like i was you know obviously he then follows it up with mortal kombat which you know as a kid i was like oh okay because mortal kombat was also like a controversial video game yeah. And then, the, it's all then the same cultural sphere at the time. This is like the train spotting era. Yeah, exactly. So I was like, oh, well, this guy, you know, he, he, he's done Event Horizon. It's a big blockbuster movie that's kind of gone wrong, but he'll come back to his roots and oh. do these like, you know, cultural, you know, kind of like <laughs> shocking movies. And instead, as Duncan says, he chose the path of hackery uh, <laughs> instead of controversy, which is like super sad because his movies are really, it's all downhill from Event Horizon, put it that way. <laughs> well, you didn't like Aliens versus Predator? No, <laughs> not, in, not in, or his remake of Death Race, which is I find especially offensive, uh, loving the original. So, uh, I'm pretty sure I picked this film um i hadn't seen it in a long time we were talking briefly before we started this show about how well it's aged um i guess i should give the premise of this show first richard richard's really down on this movie i still kind of love it um so so we we start with the concept of this movie, which is that there is this spaceship called the event horizon of course on the nose that's the point of no return for a black hole Spoiler, the, the ship contains a, a, a black hole. That's its engine. Anyway, um, there's something wrong with this ship. It disappeared in the year 2040 and is now 2047. It has reappeared uh, next to Neptune, and they don't know where it's been for seven years. It was an experimental ship that was supposed to go faster than light, or actually what it does is it bends space-time to create a portal to jump between two places instantaneously, right? So they were testing it to see if they could go very, very far away from Earth. Uh, it disappeared for seven years. And now Sam Neill's character, Dr. Weir, who designed the black hole drive, gravity drive at the center of this thing, is on a mission with a bunch of Marines to go figure out what happened to the crew and rescue anybody who might still be alive. Uh, they go to the ship and then horror ensues because they find out that it actually punches a hole to a hell dimension, which makes anybody go insane and various supernatural things happen. It's never really explained beyond its hell, which is just really terrible and vague and probably the worst part of no, this movie. No, that's better. That's better. <laughs> yeah, you like that? Essentially, like, think all they do essentially is that they even almost make it look like it's just wherever Hellraiser takes you in the movie there. Everyone's just chains and it's all a sacrilegious like arc. But to me, the reason why it actually works better that they don't explain it is one, what possible explanation could work for a sci-fi movie with like faster than light travel but also a real hell dimension that you can visit which somehow would, it's implied in this, right? Our version is you just Spend space time. It's like no, you're more like you go out of our dimension and go into some presumably anti-temporal dimension where time doesn't affect you, which does fit into, by the way, a cosmology of ghosts and things. The idea is the reason a ghost might be able to present you information is maybe he's not tethered to your specific moment in time. Maybe he can access all times and information and therefore bring it to you. So that's not a terrible concept. But put it this way, it's way better to keep it a bit mysterious, in my opinion, in this sense. Like, mm. for example. They sort of even implied towards the end of the movie that, like, 
that essentially like the people in the hell dimension want to come out of it. I think it's better than Steph Mysterious because to me, you actually, what made this good is you didn't have to know this was even Lovecraft type story. You could actually think, by the way, this is in the universe like Warhammer 40K or something. It's it is like very Warhammer esque. Warp, you know, where you just teleport in there and then all the beasts eat. But that's where the Lovecraftian element comes in is the idea that there's like external entities and they want access to our dimension, isn't it? So I, I thought it was better to keep that the mystery part. This is another movie, by the way, where you're not. The problem this movie has, this is a problem a lot of these movies have, goes like this. The setup is a movie where you want to know what happens at the end. That's not what you're ever going to find out here. This is just a horror movie where you've set up a maze and essentially everyone's going to die by the end, yep. potentially. And the question is just how and in what way. Like what you actually have to learn to do here, this is something we probably should have done earlier, Richard, is people don't actually know how to watch horror movies. Like, you know, when yep. you're watching it and you're watching all, they're all running away from like Freddy or something like, oh my God, he's going to get them. Like, you, guys, guys, like, like you're you're watching like the fucking you think you're at like Universal Studios and this is a train ride you're on no like you're supposed to actually enjoy it like you're not supposed mm. to go oh fuck off this is my why would you want everyone to survive Jason be a shit movie <laughs> wouldn't it he has got away and he's fucking get whiffing like well, the actual premise is to watch him do mayhem the actual premise hell is to see people's souls get torn apart like well, you're actually supposed to sort of buckle in and go I'm here to see these poor sons of bitches get absolutely put through the grinder now let's fucking let's see it let's see yeah. it. Okay. well let's why see this it. why exactly. this works too i agree and why this works and it, it, there's several reasons why i think that event horizon actually makes this situation more credible because obviously when you watch a lot of the horror movies it, the question is you know why don't you just leave right well mm. you can't leave because you're on a ship and your own ship has been damaged so they the the craft they send to retrieve the event horizon gets damaged so they're trying to repair it to get the hell out and also because this thing is ma actively manipulating the crew members minds and making them irrational because the ship itself has basically become demonically possessed which then leads the crew members to have various visions which then causes them to have strange behavior and many of them to die eventually so i found the reasoning behind every crew member's behavior to be quite logical in this context. And it did make the whole movie feel more realistic. Yeah. I mean, so the other part to add, of course, is that uh, for some reason, which by the way, that phrase is going to get used a lot in this for some reason, the ship is not only demonically possessed, but sort of incapable of reading the minds of the people who were on it. Uh, the previous crew literally fucked themselves to death uh in in an orgy um and and now it can tap into the things you're most afraid of so in sam neil's case he's racked with guilt because he was working on creating the event horizons black hole engine that folds space time so you can be anywhere at any moment um, he worked on it so much that his wife got super lonely and killed herself in a bathtub. So she keeps popping up with no eyes in a series of irritating jump scares. Um, <laughs> which, does have, it, which does lead to one of the best screams ever in cinema history when, that's, when Sam Neill's in the fucking pod. And he, ah, he really goes for it. But yeah, like, you know, I, I, I don't know about the logical aspect of this. I, I, I think the problem this movie really has is that it does a pretty good job in the first, like, 40 minutes of doesn't tell you anything, only shows you little bits. There's a real good sense of foreboding. It's ramping up, and then suddenly it just goes off the rails and people start doing weird shit and inexplicable shit like i don't know like why that kid justin baby bear as he's just <laughs> called a few people out of nowhere for no reason none of these motherfuckers have backstories like they are just fodder for the machine you know why, why would you put your hand in a fucking you know it's a black hole engine you've been brief you were in that briefing what are you touching it for dog? And, that, and, that, and now you're having nightmares and trying to kill yourself yeah. so yeah i don't know there's there's too much there's too much stuff in this movie that like for me doesn't make sense you know what i mean well it, um it also liberally steals from other better movies oh. 
So even aliens, the, most yeah, exactly. Well, no, I mean, come on, man. Like especially aliens at the start. That was the first thing I'm going to yeah. bring up. It's virtually the exact same situation that you see with Ripley and the Marines crew at the start of Aliens, yeah. where yep. it is a good exposition device because you need to have the situation explained and Ripley serves as the expert to, to, to describe the, the situation with the aliens to those Marines. Sam Neill, Dr. Weir serves as the expert to describe the event horizon situation to, to these Marines. Uh, but even the aesthetic of the ship is extremely similar in look and feel to, to aliens. Yeah, their ship that, yeah, their ship is like really, it's like future tech, but like, cobbled together it looks yes. like shitty you know what i mean yeah it, it looks it's like it was all it was that it was the the aesthetic of the science fiction of the era my wife mentioned it looked like the matrix as well yeah. which it which it really does which is this like you say this kind of shitty cobbled together um and it even it, even down to the details like the pinup girls on the walls is very reminiscent of of aliens the the mannerisms of the soldiers who are kind of weirdly out of line and disorderly they're smoking cigarettes in this ship um yeah it it, it feels it feels very 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 similar to cooper yeah, is literally in the wrong movie like Co <laughs> cooper like was meant to be an alien and like he got he got like fucking sent into event horizon by accident like he doesn't belong in this film it's like so crazy his character is so tonally out of whack with everything else that's going on in this film listen up doc i'm your best friend okay i'm the lifesaver and the heartbreaker it's even even just the little things about the details like the sets actually look really good both on the event horizon and inside the lewis and clark which is the rescue ship that they're on i think it visually looks great so it's not a it is yeah. just derivative the lewis and clark it's not a knock on the actual construction of those sets because it looks good but it's it's almost like they're just obsessed with the details i don't know if you guys noticed this but on the bridge of the lewis and clark lords fishburne is the captain of the ship and he has this really stupid like floating chair that turns very slowly and they motorized yeah. it for basically no reason and there's one scene when they're getting off the ship to go to the event horizon where Lawrence Fishburne's character literally just slowly turns this mechanical chair around and then gets up to walk off the ship instead of just standing up out of the fucking chair in the first place. So it's like they're invent. It's like they put this motor on the chair and they they said, we made this, we have to use it, even though no human being would actually use this piece of technology this way. And the technology is in fact useless in and of itself. So it, it was like funny. the desk A-League, Duncan. <laughs> <laughs> Utterly pointless. That'll be a quarter of a million dollars, please. That is one of the problems this movie has, though, which is, as you say, I actually do think the first half of it's pretty good. You actually mm. think after the first half, like, ooh, where's this going to go for the rest of the movie? Obviously, I've rewatched it, but I'm putting myself in the position of pretending I don't know the rest. The problem is, like you say, it does that thing that some horror movies do, which is once they decide it's go time, they just never let the finger off the bottom. It's just like, yeah. hey, give it a fuck, you let it breathe, will you, mate? And then, Whereas from then, it's just essentially everyone's just having super paranoid visions, slowly getting their comms cut off, then keep Killed. then you rush in to save them but they're dead or they're traumatized and so like a few things i did think were problematic with this mm. is like first of all yeah they obviously ripped off the total like hr geiger style from alien massively so one thing i did think was a clever touch people might miss is the engine itself where it's all those like circular things does actually look a bit if people know the famous biblical concept of what an angel might look like which is actually it wouldn't look like a human with like wings it would be like wheels within wheels if people remember there's a vision of like yeah. ezekiel sees that in heaven or whatever it's like there's that if anyone knows that famous meme where someone's like piercing the veil some alchemist guy and he's leeching outside of space time they always show that shout side so i think that's they did try to put that and some of the catholic stuff in to reference the idea of like a supernatural realm even the whole thing of like you do the classic thing where you get a piece of info but it's not quite right of like oh i think he's saying save me in latin and then later on he's like save yourselves from hell yeah. which is like <laughs> look that does that's you can by the way even the way that's delivered that is sort of the tone of how they deliver it like unfortunately there isn't a great payoff there and then similarly right one of probably probably the most whack moment of the movie is i don't think this is even intentionally meant to be this 
this, but I can't take you seriously, Richard, if you know the history of classic cinema. If you say to me where we're going, you won't need eyes to see because that's just <laughs> Back to the Future, end of Back to the Future yeah, 1. We don't need roads. Except yeah, you're exactly. just with eyes now. Where you know, we're going, we don't need yeah. eyes. Well, I'm so <laughs> But to me, it was a callback, and it was very jarring. So, <laughs> it's, no, I mean, they, I also, mean, they also just do a bunch of stuff. I mean, obviously, this is better as a psychological thriller where you, you know, the... it's like said, it's a good movie to watch if you're high. By the way, if you want to, if you've never watched it before, and you want to watch it while you're high. It will be like engrossing during all the dream sequences, and it'll be yeah. really eerie. But it's not a great movie. It's not a, it's yeah, not a very I, good movie. I, I do agree that it, it really does have a pretty sharp decline in quality once the actual horror shenanigans start because they're a bit too on the nose i think the the concept is just so fucking good though of this movie and it yes. could have been so much more but again they they just continue to steal tropes i mean they stole the like blood rushing from the shining where shining. the elevator doors open because it becomes too how are you much. gonna rip off the shining and think no one's gonna say anything about it as well like <laughs> the sheer fucking hubris of that by the way right? so there's this point where the, for no reason by the way and the, the movie totally doesn't need this the ship just fills with blood and there's this tank in the middle and it explodes and all this blood rushes out very similarly to the way the elevator doors open in The Shining and unleash the blood down the hallway, which, as you say, Richard, is one of the most iconic scenes in horror. So how you think you could get away with just copying that shot is an absolute mystery to me. And it also adds nothing to the movie, unlike The Shining, where it's very impactful. No, there's nothing biological about the ship. It's a possessed demonic ship. It doesn't have blood. Where's the blood from? <laughs> Who's blood? Why? Why? How? How can it move it around? Like this is what I mean. Like towards the end of the film, the the world building they did like pretty well for the first like forty minutes. It totally breaks down. It and and uh, you know, look. So a little bit of back, background about this film. I, I I know it sounds like you know this as well. This film wasn't meant to be released when it was released. Right. Because what, what happened was Paramount wanted Titanic to be their big summer movie in 1997. And they knew that was going to be a winner. But James Cameron's production had just fucking, it got out of control. And there was no way he was going to make a summer release. It was meant to be a summer blockbuster movie. So the other big movie they put a budget into, and this had a budget of $60 million, which for a sci-fi horror is pretty fucking insane in 1997. <clears throat> they, they were like, okay, we can just repurpose that and put that out. And they took one look at what they'd been filming. And at that point, all they'd really done were like the fucking orgy scenes that we don't even see, by the way. They'd, they'd just cut in there for brief seconds. But what they were sending back in the dailies was the complete orgy of death that the first crew of the event horizon goes on and they were like this is a fucking nightmare we can't <laughs> repurpose this as a summer blockbuster so they got involved and what's crazy about this movie is the original edit was intended to be over t you know two hours two hours 20 minutes something like that a long movie this comes in at like 90 minutes like it, it is in and out like movies used to be and, and and I think that's why that fucking around with the structure, that fucking around with post-production, they didn't even get a full 10 weeks in post-production. They, they cut that as well to get it out. It just makes everything feel so rushed in the second half. And I think there's set pieces that don't even make sense. There's characters that have like little illusions, like, oh, like, you know, uh, the doctor... Uh, I specialize in trauma, and he's hard as fuck, and he's got a massive scar from neck to nuts. What's that about? You'll never know. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, so, so there's loads of stuff in there, and like I say, I, I think trying to repurpose a Lovecraftian sci-fi horror as the big summer blockbuster hit <laughs> is is it, it was a bridge too far. It wasn't possible, and and uh, you know this is like a movie that you know we can never get a director's cut for because they lost all the original yeah that that's a, it was a very interesting story about losing the original footage so as richard said apparently the original cut that they started showing to test audiences was over two hours long and all of the film i don't know what this means it's a complete non sequitur guys was apparently put in a transylvanian salt mine and degraded yeah. over time to a state where it is currently unusable and i guess I guess Paul Paul Anderson said that apparently one of the producers is a VHS copy of the two hour cut, but doesn't know for sure. And apparently doesn't want to find it or 
you put the effort in. So I guess we'll never know. But there were extended scenes. As Richard said, apparently some of the scenes that they filmed of the previous crew going crazy, they used like porn stars and amputees. Yes. And it was like really crazy. Um, wish we could see that because we only get the like very strange 10 seconds. Not because I think it would make it a better movie. I think it probably makes it a worse movie because the more explanation you do, I think the worse this movie gets. So in a way, it might be a blessing that you only get that one really quick shot. Um, By the way, imagine being that poor bastard, Paul W.S. Anderson. So you're all just going through life in Hollywood. Oh, what you do, director? All right, shh, what you make of it? So what was your name again? Paul, Paul Anderson. Oh, I fucking love Magnolia. No, no, no. I'm just doing it oh, right. Are you the one who made? No, that's that's him as well. That's him as well. Boogie we Wes look, Anderson? You haven't seen the movies I've made. Never mind. Just P. Anderson. Just, just leave it at P. P. Anderson. Because the only thing I'll say about this movie is I also agree the problem is it's it simultaneously suffers from a lack of character development and then almost thinking that like you care about the characters simultaneously which is it yeah. are they fodder for the maze and to see the ship fuck them all up which i'm there for or am i supposed to care because the one thing i found annoying was i don't care about like the realism angle that monty's saying here a movie like this inherently is supposed to be logical like i want the lovecraftian entity slash power to warp your mind and to make you delusional and so what they could have done like i thought this is what they were doing in the first 40 minutes is you think the reason they're showing you flashbacks and you're having hallucinations is because they're going to play with that angle but there's no there is nowhere they're all one-dimensional like they all present that they have a trauma this woman's her son and then obviously that guy had his wife that he never took by the way how ham-fisted is that like oh, i'm trying yeah. to create a device that can like bend space and time but in the end i didn't have time enough for my own wife <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> again like yeah. i'm not even high yet that's just blowing my mind raw but even worse like when you do it with that woman and then you do it with the, the fucking, the former, the guy who he lost a crew member in fire yeah. and all that, that's mega revealing, but you don't go anywhere with it. Like, that's just, that's just the nasty element. Like I thought it was going to be more like each time you see a vision, it reveals a bit more about why they like can't let go of that vision, why that haunts them still to this day. Cause that part does make sense. The idea that your traumatic, very vivid, real things that happen to you that are horrific in your life could overpower your current reality and make you do questionable things. It's actually a very relatable idea. So basically most mental illness is based around and there are a million movies about drugs and or magic at which there, this is the key thing. In fact, I even want to introduce an idea to people. There's a concept that comes from like Tibetan Buddhism of a, called, a thing called a tulpa, which is essentially, it's like in your mind, you create an entity and you try and like sustain it using exercises. So it was an external entity to you. And their premise becomes, if you do this enough and you're imbued with enough of your like life force, it actually will externally exist independent of you. And even if you die like there's almost like an element of that in this movie where these people just couldn't let go of these traumatic events and so in the presence of this device whatever the machine is like essentially that is more powerful to them than their real life if no one's ever had a really high like dosage psychedelic experience probably the most weird thing is that it's that it's not that what you're seeing is like oh so this is reality it's like no this but this is more vivid than reality like if anything yeah. it makes me feel like the reality was the one what was that the black mirror episode and i'm really in this universe. you get that vibe so like that was all like really like, ominous that could be going somewhere like oh get interesting but then just doesn't go anywhere with that that he just stares <laughs> at that note and it's just horror people die like they don't even really despite the fact they have about four cracks in it they don't even really do anything with the sam neil character and the fact nope. that he's now the evil you know like you keep thinking they're set up for a massive sort of like you know the new one like lay out the play no yeah it's just the same shit it's like essentially where we're going we don't need eyes you, know? <laughs> you, haven't, you, haven't, you haven't you haven't even fucked it yet you know what i mean like, wrecked him yeah. but he's asshole bleep like, it's, like, it's all, just all cra shit cracks at the end of it i know like, well, there's, there's so many ridiculous things as well. Like he dies, he dies, and then reappears and just goes, The ship brought me back. I know. Oh, how? <laughs> how? Like none of this is you, there's nothing set up here. It doesn't work. <laughs> the ship brought me back. I told you she won't let me leave. She won't let anyone leave. No, it's, it's, so just a, it's just a deus ex machina where he gets sucked yeah. out of the, the broken window uh, at the yeah. and the bridge of the ship. And then like five minutes later, he's like, I'm back, baby. And he's just in the <laughs> engine room. Oh, don't get me started on that. But look, I, I, here's one thing I did because people liked it last time. I, I, I got some of the reviews. Oh, boy. Uh, from, from the time. These are super short. Uh, because they didn't have a lot of good things to say. It's like the Spinal Tap shit sandwich review. But it's right. So here's one. Uh, this is from cinemaphile.org. 
If I were a psychologist hired to analyze the people who made this, I would conclude everyone involved needed to take their inner child out back and shoot it. <laughs> Washington Post, if you want to have that Event Horizon experience without spending the seven bucks, try this instead. Put a bucket on your head and have a loved one beat on it vigorously with a wrench for 100 minutes. Same difference. And the last one, and this will be Duncan's favorite, I wager, this is from filmcritic.com. A retarded goth version of 2001. That's fire. That is actually fire at the end. There you go. Okay. He, did the, he nailed the 30 second elevator pitch. <laughs> By the way, it also does contain some pure classic cheese lines. Like the one where essentially, yeah. this is also when we talk about From Beyond, there's another classic element of this. It's the whole thing of like, it's running itself. <laughs> it's <just> like, <laughs> yeah. Why? Yeah. I mean, Why I, I, I wrote down. So I don't know. I wrote down some of the lines of the dialogue as well. I did a whole page on dialogue because the dialogue in this movie is garbage. Is. I mean, it's like, it is really bad. So the bit where they're walking into the Event Horizon engine and they're in the spinny room, uh, it, it, he said, you don't need to say this, by the way, because it looks like what you think it is. And he goes, looks like a meat grinder to me. Yeah, we know. <laughs> we know. That's the point. Uh, then there was another one. Um, the, the, they, they go... Right, the, the walls are covered in viscera. <laughs> and someone goes, got some blood here. <laughs> like, like, right. By the way, in general, I do like that. Like, the first, about yeah. the first four or five times they go in rooms. Remember, they know the last crew's dead, all violent in somewhere. But every time they keep going and going, there must be another bloody coolant leaking here. No, but that's like, coolant levels are perfectly like It's just blood, obviously, <laughs> isn't it? It's just all, flood, it's just yeah. all bloody coolant everywhere. What's going on? Then, a man with no eyes and a lacerated face, his lips are off, bumps in zero gravity, bumps yeah. into the back of someone to, for a cheap jump scare. And the woman who shit her pants immediately then follows it up and goes, a corpsicle. <laughs> right? There was that. Looks like it was caused by, it. I don't know, an animal or something. Another damage to the soft tissue. Massive abrasions. Corpsicle. There's an argument between the doctor and Cooper, who we are going to talk about. Uh, and uh, he tries to explain what's going on. And Cooper goes, don't start with that physics shit. <laughs> then you have the bit about hell, which I think this is the, the worst. Um, they're having a conversation, uh, Lawrence Fishburne, and I think Sean Pertwee, who is actually, I, I think Sean Pertwee is like, if Sam Neill carries the movie, Sean Pertwee's also there giving him a hand. He's great in this film. Um, and it, they say, save yourself from hell. Uh, you don't believe in hell, do you? Then the captain the captain saying it in Latin sure did. And then Cooper sticks his head around the corner and goes, let's get the hell out of here. It's like, oh, my God. Beam <laughs> me the fuck up. This is bad. Like, I mean, the script in this film is fucking cheeks. It's absolutely sucks. There's not one. one... You, you know, one thing you referred to as well is they do do that really lazy thing of when you introduce the whole crew in like the first 10 minutes, they are just sort of like, look, right, we haven't got time to fucking introduce characters. You remember those characters from other movies such as Predator, yeah. Aliens, they're all here. You know, that guy, yeah. white fucking guy, this guy doesn't give a shit about physics. This guy, yeah. it's just Denzel Washington, but we couldn't afford him, so we got this guy instead. He's doing Denzel Washington. Like, hey, what are you doing? Like, it's just, it's all the fucking Characters you've seen in every other movie, <laughs> mate. The, the bit with Cooper when he gets when he gets blown out when he's off the side of the ship, yes. when the Lewis and Clark gets blown up, and that he's doing this like exposition where everything he's doing to survive, he's saying out loud. It, it, it's and he's going like, I know what I'll do. I'll blow my gas tank, and then uh, <laughs> and then it, like this is meant to be a Lovecraftian psychological horror as he jets off towards the event horizon. He screams, here I come, motherfuckers! <laughs> come on, come on, yes! 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 Here I come, motherfuckers! What? Is, this is ridiculous. Like, they they, they just couldn't be asked in the second half of the film. The, like I say, the, the, the script... Is awful. I, it's one of the worst. And I put it this way: I always criticize the Matrix for having a terrible script. Like I, I, I don't fuck with the Matrix. I, I think it's like again concept over script writing. Um, I think it's got. I think it's got a really dog shit script. And but this is like nothing I've ever seen. This is like somebody said: dialogue doesn't matter. Let's just get from scene to scene. The scenes will be fine. You don't really need to say anything of substance. There's not one quotable in this film. That's like quite an achievement. Uh, but. 
I think the strength of this film is that it is in, the concept is so good, just like The Matrix, and it is incredibly memorable. And also, I think this film has actually had sure a pretty is. a pretty big effect on other forms of media because the kind of derelict, haunted space Hulk, uh, which has had many parallels across video games like Dead Space, uh, you know, uh, it, it it probably had some level of of effect on Warhammer Forty K as well mm, yeah, yeah um you know this has become a much more tro common trope these days but this was not something that was really heavily explored at the time of its creation which i think is really cool yeah i think spaceship haunted house you know spooky lightning references to hammer horror you know the house that drip blood yeah i get it i mean i you know i can i can see look i did write down prose it's just it's just like four lines. <laughs> like, what are your pros? I'm curious to hear what your pros well, are. Well, so the, 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 the production design is really good, I think. I mean, I mean the, the design of the movie. Event Horizon is amazing, yeah. and the gravity yeah. drive is incredibly cool. Yeah, the gravity drive, again, it's big spiky room for no reason. Um, and, but but as Duncan says, I, I I think the gravity drive looked. I think that holds up really well as an idea with the you know ball you know generating the energy and all of that, and it looks really good. I think overall ship design is good. I think in terms of like even just little touches, like you know having the presence of mind to you have to be in liquid uh, when you go into the you know hyper jump because you, you're taking so many g's your bone bones would liquefy so they have to put you in there to preserve your structural integrity there's loads of like little cool production design parts to this like for sure and you know it, it, it for a 90s movie it still looks pretty good i think the special effects in general are a little bit hokey uh in terms of like you know the blood effects and stuff like that but i think the ship the way the ships look and the models, I think they look great too. I think that I think it's a you know it's a good looking film, but oh and and the build up's good. That's what I wrote here. Build up is good, only a few jump scares. Oh, and it's got a reference to "Don't Look Now" in it with the kid, the ghost baby. Oh yeah, that that's actually yeah. a good point. Yeah, but I mean that's it. That that those were my pros. <laughs> so, I don't the know. problem this this movie has is like it just it didn't decide what the central theme was of the movie. Yeah. It just had one idea and it never did anything with it. Because to me, like, look, I can forgive like the American angle of like like the idea you would actually call the ship like the Lewis and Clark. Just go fuck yourselves, Americans. <laughs> just don't give me even any level of fucking nuance. Like not nothing yeah. at all. But that's fine. The Event Horizon one's actually quite clever because if people do mm. know the whole premise of an Event Horizon is there's even the term escape the Event Horizon. Like yeah. you can't. The idea is once you've gone in, you're fucked at that point. You can travel out forever. You'll always be contained with it. That's quite good for foreshadowing for the premise of the movie. It's the idea once you go there, like all of Carthy and horror. Once you engage with it, you are forever changed. And you can never escape, and you might not want to. Slash might want to kill yourself. Slash might want to save all of humanity or tell everyone turn back etc that's all good but the biggest problem i had with it was like you actually could have done so much with the design like think how silly the design is for the actual premise the premise is it's not a world with spirituality and supernatural and demons and hell it's a totally rational materialist nuts and bolts world if this is a machine and this is an engine and here's what it does yeah. but it just so happens oh the guy who did all the aesthetics yeah he was full on warhammer 40 k out mate he was living the <laughs> chaos gods like, if anything in that scenario you've got to at least make Sam Neil like have a t element of like, but maybe we were always trying to contact something. If he did that, now I'd be really thrilled. Imagine if the second half it actually turns out he he wasn't just a scientist; he was part of some sort of deranged cultists who were trying to contact these extra. That would be fucking sick. Because the other premise is, why would it look like that? Then that looks yeah. so like some Hellraiser <laughs> technology. Yeah. It's steampunk, but Hellraiser out in it, like all fucking gr like gristling balls and maces and shit, and, sh and it's just like that's why everything's just skin and bones everywhere so well, the last thing that was going to be the reveal at the end because why right. did he make the drive and why does he yeah. say i'm already home you know why does he do <laughs> yeah. all that stuff right and that it's like yeah I, I i thought it was all like a setup you know yes 
Because that's nah. the thing that was so silly to me is because to me, there's two ways you do this. It's either, which is what they try to pull off, but they don't really do a good job. It's the idea that like this is some Prometheus slash Faustian bargain shit of like, if you yeah. want to attain extra extraordinary power, it comes at an extraordinary price. Usually your soul slash you have to give something up to the dark forces. That would be one element because actually that could tie into the Sam Neill character and all these people have regrets and that's why they're going to do it. Like maybe yeah. he did like classic storyline, by the way. Oh, this guy's so trying to make time machine because his dad died and he wanted to contact him like it's a classic angle you can go with that all day or you do it like this like you actually also knew that literally and that was the bargain you were willing to make it's like right yeah fuck it let's contact the spirit world let's go into this other dimension because that's the only place we can find our dead loved ones or tormented ones or whatever. that would be a pretty cool ending but they don't really do that they just sort of no. hint at that and then do a bunch of bad one-liners like i say and then the movie's over the actual last half it's funny the filled up so slow the last half feels like it's forever but it's actually about the same time is the build up yeah uh, and, and wait, Christopher wait, wait. What, what can you say about a scientist that can build a drive that folds space but doesn't know Latin he says <laughs> like, he is and he goes that's like no language I've ever heard and then the dude on the ship goes it's Latin and it's like that scene in Futurama where they've got that like universal language translator and they speak French and he goes crazy gibberish <laughs> And this is my universal translator. Unfortunately, so far, it only translates into an incomprehensible dead language. Hello. Bonjour. Crazy gibberish. <laughs> you know, it's like, like what you've never encountered Latin in, in like 2047 or whatever it is, or 2052 as a fucking scientist. Latin yeah. got phased out somewhere along the line, did it? Yeah. Fuck yeah. Off. Especially as, a, especially as a scientist, as you're saying, um, I, I think for, to, to Thorin's point, I think what his his concept of this movie would also make Sam Neill's character stronger in the beginning, because uh, unfortunately, they never really do anything with the fact that Sam Neill's character is in denial about the events on the ship, even though he is seeing visions of his suicide dead wife. Right. Everyone yeah. else is like, oh, there's this crazy thing happening and I'm seeing this and holy moly, like this, there's there's some unexplained monster that's punching at the door of the bridge that, by the way, never gets resolved or appears ever again. Um, but he basically is trying to explain everything scientifically. And either that is an interesting character choice because he wants to be the rational one on this ship and he is actually in denial about the things he is he is seeing and doesn't want any kind of supernatural explanation. But then that doesn't line up with where his character ends up going in the film. Or, to Thorin's point, it would have been more interesting if he was just trying to gaslight them as he was intentionally opening this doorway to hell and seeing what would happen. You notice, yeah. just, this is also you know, something you'll find out when we talk about From Beyond as a similar quality. Another thing that's a classic in Lovecraft, you'll notice, is it's not enough that you've just gotten fucked up and made contact. Now you must, like, essentially bring all of humanity into this realm. Everyone must experience it. Everyone must go to hell. That's quite a sinister idea. They just don't do much with that I either. It's just essentially just like, oh, they're all creepy and they want to get you. It's like, here's the thing. I don't ever in these movies that I say I need the why. You don't have to give me the explanation. Just do some fun with it though. Like do have like like essentially this movie needed like another act. It needed something big to happen at the end. It's like I yeah, say, the it, last scene, it, like the last thing with the, as soon as the guy has his eyes wrecked and cut out and he's an evil <laughs> captain, at that point, it's just that for the next like 25 minutes or whatever. Like he doesn't go anywhere. It just keeps doing that for 25 minutes. Yeah. And I've got to say as well, I mean, the end of the film it's like it, it. It's a nothing ending, so it's like they they. Uh, so Lawrence again, spoilers. Lawrence Fishburne uh, goes and sacrifices himself to blow up the ship by manually uh, setting off explosives that they were planting to blow away the structure that connected the drive to the front end of the ship, which can detach and you know they could have floated through space and wait for a rescue crew. Uh, so he kills himself, kills Sam Neill, or so you think. The ship go, is pre-programmed to go back into the scary door, through the scary door <laughs> it goes. And then um, uh, Cooper and the lady whose name I forget. Because she only does, yeah, thank you. Uh, they survive. And then it ends with and them Justin getting survives. Rescued. Baby Bear also lives in a very touching Yeah, way. but like, he's fucked. 
<laughs> so people who don't know, Baby Bear goes out of an airlock, but somehow lives. Like, I don't know, dude. It's like, I'm not even sure of the science of that, but like blood was coming out of his face. So I don't know. Like, for, the, the, the doctor even said, won't be pretty, but he's going to live. L- <laughs> lots, lots to talk about there, you'd think. But no, actually, they just stick him in a tube and leave him there. So yeah, technically Baby Bear lives as well. But uh, anyway, they get picked up by a rescue crew at the end. The rescue crew comes in. Takes off the mask, it's scary man with no eyes, Ooh, jump scare, and then it turns out, no, they're okay. And it's Cooper uh, holding her, saying, it's going to be all right, we're safe, we're safe. Door slams, and then they play the prodigies. Oh, my God, that's the funky shit. <laughs> that part, Richard, is where I did realise how dated this movie was, because when I heard that, I thought, that's a fucking old school. Wait a minute, that's yeah, actually that's the time. That's when this album was out, was actually this year, you're right. Like, that was, to them, that was their version of, like, The Matrix. Like, this is the coolest what? music hey, available right now. I love the apology. That part has... It aged very well, I will say. No, so so for me, at the end, the ending sucks as well because it doesn't even make any sense. It you don't know what's happening next, or like it's, it, it's I don't know. It, they, and, and to tag on like a little ooh, shock jump scare as well, it's really cheap. Here's so, why we needed to do uh, this movie though, because as yeah. you noticed here, one, you can tell a lot of people saw this only when it came out. Two, even when I've rewatched it, it's only been like times when I was high and I was looking for like a silly movie to watch at night or something, you know, it wasn't like I wasn't watching it at home cinema setup or whatever. Like it hasn't aged very well as a movie. But two, no. if you mention this genre, every fucking twat out there is gonna tell we have to watch this movie. Like, yeah, you've got yeah. to watch it. Because there's one thing you all do. It's I, I noticed this first with anime, but they do it with every fucking subgenre. They just <laughs> have to take ones like this is an all right one off you need to watch it right but it's not a classic it's not like an all-time great movie if you go around telling people within your first three or four movie recommendations this movie they're just going to think you're a moron and not listening to your movie recommendations anymore i'm telling you this is an example of one you have to know is a guilty pleasure it's not a good movie yeah. i would never but what's interesting is recommend this to someone and hope, hope they go this, away and enjoy it this movie annihilation and from beyond all have a 6.6 rating on imdb <laughs> Because the cult following around this movie is like mega. Like people, yeah. people really do fuck with this film. But again, I I think it's because the concept is so strong. The idea yeah. is so well, strong. Also, the 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 aesthetics are very strong. I mean, it is really like yeah. the the scenes of Sam Neill with his eyes gouged out and his like crazy grin. It, those are some really good shots. And they're very eyes. They're, they're they're very memorable shots, right? I'll never that. be able to get that <laughs> line at <laughs> <We're laughs> <going. We need laughs> I'll tell Steve, you another good line. Actually, I'm wrong. That? There is one quotable in it. There is one quotable. I've nearly forgot. Probably the best. It is the line of the movie. When they look at the fucking... When they finally decode the CD, because they used CDs oh, yeah. in 2057, <laughs> and they see the orgy where everyone fucks themselves to death, and Lawrence Fishburne's just watching it on the screen, and it goes off, and he goes... We're leaving. <laughs> that, there it is right there. That's the, that is the highlight of the movie. We're leaving. Like, that is actually great. I think Lord Sisburne uh, is actually good at this movie. And his character, mm, his character uh, is also relatively He's good. got nothing to do, really. I mean, you know, again, he suffers from this fact that He's meant to have this really cool backstory. He was a captain. There was a fire on his previous ship. He had to leave a crewmate to die. It's haunted him. He's driven by never losing a crew member again. And yet here he is in spooky haunted spaceship and everyone's dying. It could have been good, but he's actually got nothing to do, nothing to say. There's no, there's no like, there's no drama. I, I think that's, I, I think that's a key thing. There's no need in any scene for anyone to emote. <laughs> You just have to play frightened, or in Sam Neill's case, no eye scary guy. <laughs> that, it's like there's actually no, no reason to act in this film at all, and it's it really shows that it's just so it's so sad, man. Because I say I used to fuck with this film back in the day. This came out on like VHS in like 1998 DVD, whatever the fuck we were watching back then. And you know, I used to be a Warhammer nerd. This was like this was like our movie, like because it did it did have that Space Hulk kind of feel, and, you know. We, it did have that idea of like you know, like you say, the warp and things beyond it. And we used to watch this movie, we used to get drunk and watch this movie, and you know, we used to, uh, again fond memories of, of of that as an experience. But 
watching it now as an adult and sort of trying to compare it to just cinema. <laughs> It's a fucking sick joke. This movie blows. So, uh, for, so people are aware. Um, Amazon has said that they are remaking this as a TV series. No which, shit, a TV series. Oh, that it, might be mega. It might, it might be good because I, I, it's one of those things where, as we say, the concept is so strong. And they announced this, I believe, in 2019, and there hasn't been any follow-ups. But uh, as far as I can tell, it hasn't been canceled, and it's still in development. Oh, my and, God, you're right. And it it could actually be good. It may not be like a multi-series, like multi-season series, but it could be a mini-series. And because the concept is good, if this is done well, it could actually turn into something pretty phenomenal. Um because the potential Lawrence is there. Lawrence Fishburne, there's an interview here, and it says Lawrence Fishburne is open to a return to the TV <laughs> series. Why would you ever, like, even want to remember that you did this film? <laughs> Why would you? I would just be like, what? Event Horizon, what's that? Don't remember. Yeah, man. Oh, well, listen, I that, they're, they're in as a solution to the problem, because obviously we live in a time of remakes and reboots and soft reboots and, and everything else. I, this, is a, this is definitely... Uh, a movie with concept so big and so broad to fit it into 90 minutes is impossible. You know, there there are some ideas that just take time to percolate and really deliver on the premise. And so a TV series might actually be legit. I could get behind that. I also think a flaw this movie had as well was even when they start to show you the visions of each of the characters, they sort of blow their load on it too quick. Like, what I would mm. do is this. You would initially get, like, a slight, like, you'd see a vision of someone for a second or you'd see them run around a corner. But the idea is it wouldn't initially be terrifying, so you would keep it to yourself. You'd be like, what the fuck? Is this only happening to me? Like, what the fuck, that person? And and it would make it more and more and more. And then you get to a point where, like, if you disobey, like, your survival instinct, you get trapped in a machine or you die or you reach for something... Because the problem is they just sort of like, they just it's another switch they just flip on or off. It's on and you believe everything. You can't do anything. You have to irrationally go towards your dream slash your person you're haunted by slash whatever you're trying to overcome. Mm. Or it's just off again. It's reality. It's like, oh, the lights are on. Like, what the fuck? They, they, they make that a bit too jarring. Whereas to me, I wanted it to be like, Essentially, they didn't make me believe that, like, you would actually be irresistibly drawn to, like, whatever you're haunted by. But you could have done that. Like, I feel like that element just wasn't engaged within the movie for me. I, I, I think yeah. the the most successful aspect was the slow burn of Sam Neill's character where all of the, the horror is inside him. And he's just kind of going more and more crazy as time goes on, sitting in the captain's chair on the bridge, kind of just being distant from everyone else. Because I think that's the scariest part of the movie is what's going on in Sam Neill's mind prior to him uh, gouging out his own eyes, right? Because he's actively in denial about the supernatural stuff on the ship. He himself is seeing visions. He himself is doubting everything that he's done in his entire life, and it's driving him mad. And you you see that, like, reflected in his face while he's just kind of silently in the background of some of these things, scenes. And that is, that's the coolest underpinning of the movie for me. Yeah, I, I think as well, though, like, one of the things that I, I, I sort of, I almost find distasteful is the borrowing there it's such a derivative film and it doesn't need to be because it's got such a strong central premise you don't need to mimic aliens you don't need to borrow from i mean the, the again the nerve of borrowing from like solaris you don't need to do the scene from the shining you know, uh, it, it's like you don't need to do any of these things. In fact, you could make this really understated uh, and and it would probably succeed as a much better film. I, I almost don't think you have to show any of the stuff that happens, any of the action set pieces. I think the movie is worse for the things they it felt it needed to sort of find an audience. And, you know, like uh, you don't need to shoot out. You don't need a shootout in a Lovecraftian horror about a hell dimension. Oh, yeah. Speaking of just crap, like fucking swagger lines, here's another one. So Go there's on. that scene towards the end where Sam Neill with no eyes is just there, right? And then fucking like whatever his name is, I think it's Lawrence Fishman, is trying to like bomb rush him. And he has like that nail gun and he goes, you want to put a hole in the edge of this ship? He goes, who said I'd miss it? You miss me, you blow out the hole. What makes you think I'll miss? 
You don't have eyes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. You know, yeah. But he turns around. around. Yeah. But then, he, uh, but then what happens? <laughs> yeah. yeah, but then he does miss. I mean, that's the whole point. Doesn't even mean yeah. no. Well, he, no, no. He, he immediately does miss and punches the hole in the windshield of the ship that then sucks that's him out. Because Cooper saves the day. Good old Cooper just like <laughs> pancakes onto the window. Oh, here's something we need to talk about before the end. Because I know Duncan's been big on this in, in the previous episodes. The sound is embarrassing in this film. Oh, it is. The fight scene at the end where he's hitting him with the oxygen tank. And it's going like, boink, boing, <laughs> pow. There's punches. It's like fucking 60s Batman. <laughs> What the fuck is this? Like, it, it, it's really bad. And it's a shame because you know what would have really elevated this movie? I mean, you know, I say elevate. What would have helped this movie is a really good, like, moody score. That's something these other films that it's borrowing from have. You know, it, 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 it doesn't really have a good score. I think, the, I think some of the music they pick for the soundtrack as well is, like, really out of place. Um, but yeah, the sound design overall, the 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 splats and the boinks and the punch noises, really bad, really really bad. So, but this yeah. way, this is just a movie that has taught me that I here's what I now say. I go, oh, I remember that movie. Yeah, I think it was all right. That's what I say now about movies I haven't watched in a good ten years. <laughs> I, I agree with that. You want to do it is your line it's of just like I love that movie, dude. If someone just hears that and they don't know what context they mean, imagine them going home and having a home cinema set up, Monty. They go, oh well, Monty loves this. I know he loves a lot of high art and stuff. But shh, and imagine they're watching where we go and we won't need eyes. Like <laughs> they're just gonna ruin all that. I'm don't sorry, I love Sam Neill. It's a it first. It. It's a personal flaw, years. okay? It's a personal flaw that I love Sam Neill, and I do I'm, think it's hilarious. Mark's madness is way better than this. Way better than this. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think, um, you know, I, I guess putting some, like, final thoughts on the movie overall, I definitely think, like a lot of kind of bad movies, they're worth watching one time to kind sure, of understand. Yeah, yeah. And, and this is definitely, like, if you're interested in... Love if you're just interested in 90s cinema, honestly, because this came out at like such a weird time. Like that summer of 97 is one of the worst summer blockbuster releases of all time. Yeah, let me, like G.I. Jane came out. Let me list the movie. I mean, and by the way, guys, this isn't even close to the best science fiction film that came out in 97 because The Fifth no. Element and Gattaca also came out in 97, yeah. which are yeah. way, 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 way better <laughs> movies, especially Gattaca. Gattaca is one of my favorite movies ever. Mm. Um, but the 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 highest grossing films in ninety seven were, as Richard pointed out, Titanic, which was released later, The Lost World, Jurassic Park, uh, yes. Men in Black, also with your boy, <laughs> also with, uh, was Sam Neill? In, I don't think Sam Neill was in that one actually. I think it was oh, just no, Jeff, was, it was no, Jeff Goldblum. Oh, the sequel. No, yeah. I th did he not appear in the sequel? No, God, only Jeff watched, Goldblum. I, I think oh, I thought he turned up at the start. My bad. I'm pretty sure only Jeff Goldblum from the original movie was in that one. Uh, it was also well, bad. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, Men in yeah. Black, which, by the way, holy moly, that movie has not aged well. Uh, Tomorrow Never, I never Dies. I never liked it, so. <laughs> Tomorrow Never Dies, which I, I actually watched again recently. Um, it's the Michelle Yeoh, uh, Pierce Brosnan, James yeah. Bond movie uh, about the, basically, it, it's about Steve Jobs being evil, effectively, um, which yeah. is, it's actually kind of good. Air Force One. The, I mean, these are the movies that were popular at the time. So, um, yeah, it was a kind of awkward year. I feel like a lot of those movies didn't age very well. No, I, I think 97, it, it, like, I, I, like maybe, maybe late 90s movies just don't age well. Because <laughs> I can think of movies from like 94, 95 that still hold up to this day. You wouldn't ever dream of like saying these were like, oh, these movies are dated, you know, shit like Pulp Fiction, you know, whatever. But like, I don't know, there just seemed to be something that was happening. Maybe it was like the advent of CGI was creeping in and, and maybe some people wanted like some last hurrahs of like big set design, big production design movies, practic the last of the practical effects, I don't know. But yeah, like late 90s movies, that whole aesthetic just sucks. 
it just sucks <laughs> i think like <laughs> you know there's just, there's just something about it like all of those films you listed that they, they 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 sort of suck they do <laughs> so except for Gattaca. and and well yeah uh, you know but but like event event horizon like I say is like one of those movies for me where it's like I couldn't even describe it as a guilty pleasure. I got to say, I took very little pleasure, <laughs> in, in, but I certainly feel guilty, uh, you know, in rewatching this. Yeah, and, I, and I haven't me, seen I, this movie in probably fifteen plus years, yeah, it's, so it's it been a very long me. time. And and you know, look, uh, one time for the Zoomers who've never seen this movie is is fine. Uh, but it's like, you know, it's one of those things. Try it once and then never speak. At least it's only an hour and a half long. Yeah, and yeah, I that's also that part of well. the problem for me is because to me this is just an episode of Twilight Zone slash Outer mm. Limits slash fucking mm. Black Mirror. It should have just been an episode if they're going to do this with it. Like they, it was right on the brink between an episode, which could have just what it had here, or you've got time to do something else with it. Oh, you're not going to just the end. That's the real. My problem is it just meandered and never went anywhere. Fair yeah. But also didn't it wasn't actually compelling enough, like I say, around the hallucinations. Like I don't care about a single the only one character I ever cared about was like the female doctor. She was sort of somewhat interesting. And even then they just played it's just the fact she had a son, that was it. Like they don't really even do that much with like the trauma aspects of it. So to me, I thought you could have just a much more skillful script, right? I could have done something with this, I think. Definitely. Um, you know, and yeah, you're right. I mean, and, and again, it's just it it's a tonal mess. It's a tonal mess and it's a pacing mess. I, these are the two sort of cinematic crimes, you know, like say what you will about like Annihilation. I think that's pretty evenly paced. I think sure. it, it, the story moves along. The thing is a masterpiece of, of pacing. Oh, yeah. I, it, you know, it, it's like it, it really ratchets up the tension while simultaneously holding your interest. And this movie, unfortunately, is it's all build up and then yeah. You know, it's the it's the lover that's gonna fuck you all night, and then five minutes later you're smoking a cigarette. That's that's what this film is. It's like so much promise, and it just doesn't deliver on any of it, really. All right. Well, I think that wraps up our conversation on Event Horizon. Uh, we are going to be doing From Beyond, the most obscure movie from that we are looking at, at least from the cosmic horror genre, released in 1986. Uh, next week, so you guys can tune into that, and we'll see you then.